Oh, the two times problem. Uh, yeah, so I modeled that on Eddington's famous two uh, two tables problem. You know, so Eddington uh, said, well, look, there's the the manifest table. You know, it's solid, hard, uh, you know, certain color. Uh, also has all sorts of properties, all these microscopic properties that we attribute to it. And yet then there's the, the table of physics. It's mostly composed of air. Uh, you know, your hand bounces off of it if you tap it because of electromagnetic forces, not because it's hitting a bunch of stuff. Um, and so you have to be able to try to reconcile these two tables. And so I thought about thinking about, uh, well, I thought about when I was writing my book, uh, uh, What Makes Time Special, I thought about, you know, the problem in a kind of similar way where we have manifest time. And I was thinking of this as not just exactly like what we perceive, but more like our kind of, the kind of model we use as we uh, navigate our life uh, uh, through time. And so we employ this kind of rough and ready model. And I think it's pretty basic. I mean, that is, I, I think it's, uh, you know, something, so I was imagining something really low level, you know, not not like our theories of cosmology in it or anything kind of very, really high cognitive. Uh, and then, uh, you know, physics and so f f physical time, f uh, then I was thinking mostly just of, you know, relativity. Uh, I mean, who knows if relativity is the final story, but that seemed like the most natural piece of physics to use because that was the only, relativity is really the only theory that takes time time as its target. And so that then, you know, made me think to, to use that. And so then the idea was then, how could I reconcile manifest time with physical time? And so I then, was off to the races on this kind of Eddington-like project. And um, yeah, and so then I, I, I think I tried, I tried to approach it in the way, the, way, the way you would like the Eddington project because I don't think, you know, you know physics by itself as we, you know, with, without having reduced all of the other sciences to physics, you're not gonna answer that problem with just physics. And so you have to introduce more sciences and more resources. And I think, you know, I begin the book, if, uh, if you looked at it, then uh, I begin the book with, uh, you know, this um, discussion between Einstein and Carnap, where Einstein laments that he says, physics will never, you know, uh, satisfactorily answer the problem of the now. And he thinks this is what it sounds like from the Thing. He thinks this is, you know, a, shame, a pity, a shame, and and sad. And then Carnap says, "Yeah, but you know, if you add more sciences, uh, well, the, the way I read him is, if you add more sciences, then you can." And so, in particular, Carnap points to psychology. And so, the second half of my book is a lot of cognitive science and biology and that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, even though you're integrating the special sciences, cognitive science, psychology. You mentioned that it's still going from here to there. We're going from whatever the best physical theory of time that can be made out to uh, the perceptual experience of time rather than the other way around, which is important uh, because I don't know if the other way around has any any real possibility to it. Yeah, you know, so uh, Bergson, uh, the famous French philosopher, I mean, his... PhD in the late 1800s uh, was an attempt to go the other way around. Um, and so you do sometimes see uh, work in phenomenology and that where you then try to get the time of physics out of the time of experience. And, you know, to be, uh, I mean, in, in, in their favor, you know, in some sense, that's gonna be what we're, we're doing when we come up with physics. As, you know, we we start off with all these observations, and the observations are done by people, uh, ultimately. And so, in some sense, this project happens. But uh, yeah, the other way around is then um, uh, a challenge. I mean, they're both challenges. And so, I didn't think of the Bergson project as really having succeeded. Uh, and I don't know if the project I had 
going the other way succeeds either, but uh, yeah, I give it my best, my best shot, really. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot more convincing is what i'll say um okay so before we proceed just for people listening do you mind uh giving a quick definition of manifest time what are the components that make up manifest time oh yeah so what i think of as manifest time is um uh well really it's sort of three components you know the, the 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 way i i mean it could start off many different ways i think in my book but what I did was with the with the book was I I thought I'm just going to start off with the now you know so that it, you think that there's this kind of special objective now uh, it's what's what's re what's really happening so you know us us talking is now uh, and from that you then also uh, divide the world into you know this kind of tripartite structure then there's the stuff before the now and the stuff after the now. And, but it's not just that some of it's before and some of it's after, it's that you attribute different properties to it. So I think of the past as settled, fixed, the future is open, ripe with possibility. Um, and then of course you think that structure changes, it updates itself. And so the three components then are this kind of, uh, are, are the privilege now, uh, the fact that it updates and as it updates, it's carrying along a past and a future with different properties. Um, you could imagine another structure in there. I mean, probably our model of time has more stuff. Uh, it's just that those are the things that seem interesting from the point of view of philosophy of time because those are the features that are just hard to, hard to find in physical time and that seem to be distinctive versus space. So no one thinks that the here, so we've got the here and the there, the left and the right. No, one's, no one thinks that those categories carve up nature in some fundamental way. And we don't attribute, you know, different features of the world to the right than the, you know, we don't say the right is fixed and the left is uh, open or anything like that. And none of those things are important to us. I mean, the, the, the key thing with the manifest time is that you know oh boy that that is really important to us you know so it shows up in all of our language thought and behavior and is arguably like a key part of what makes a human being a human being uh, so it's of interest to explain all that stuff right and, and like just as a side before we move forward um, it's also true that that experience of time, like those three things in manifest time, are are universal amongst people. Like there have been some claims from sociology and stuff that that there's differences in time perception, but um, yeah. So yeah, I, I haven't received. I, I thought I would receive more pushback actually on that than I have. I mean, maybe the people who would do the pushback ha haven't really seen the books, uh, but yeah. So there's all this work on and cognitive linguistics, anthropology, on uh, uh, variation of um, time, a uh, concept of time within human beings. And, but what I point out in the book is that actually most of that uh, research actually indirectly is an argument for the invariance of manifest or the universality of manifest time. Because most of that work is sort of looking at ways we represent manifest time differing in different cultures and so if in so in for english speakers uh and the you know in, in america you know uh this direction is is the future that direction is the past you know in other cultures that direction is the future this one's the past some of this work is super interesting because some of it you know so we're uh used to uh Representate, you know, so these are spatial representations of time, and we're used to that. Those, well, we in the U.S. anyway, our, our English speakers are used to them being um, egocentric, but of course there are some cultures where they're where they're topocentric. It depends on the local geography, and so it's very interesting to think about the conversation patterns because you know, like if we were facing each other, our futures. Our, our spatially represented futures conflict with each other. You know, like if, I, 
like I would point into your into your chest or you would point into my chest. But of course, if there's a river in the village that determines it, you know, then we both point in the same way for the past. And uh, anyway, so a lot of interesting stuff, but but all of that really, all that variation, as far as I could tell, just shows that um, manifest time, at, at least in the way I'm understanding it, where there's a kind of very low level thing is, um, is universal. You're not going to find people who think that, uh, you know, if they hit a switch, it's going to change where they were born or, you know, none of that is found. What is found also is, you know, the more high level of cognitive you go, you know, so if we think of manifest time and just think of putting more and more cognitive theoretical stuff into it, well, then of course there's going to be massive variation because, well, there's even variation among you know, top physicists about the cosmology, right? So uh, if we throw in enough stuff, you know, we'll have, and of course we'll have fine groups who have, you know, uh, will believe in like cyclical time versus non-cyclical time and things like that. But that's all kind of high level theory, where, which wasn't really what I was aiming at. Yeah, I agree. I, like the, I really like the literature on timekeeping, like clock towers and things and how they played a role it's just about for people listening uh, about how these how when uh colonial societies bought clock towers into settler societies they that created a new dynamic of how people interacted with time sociologically but i think that is far different from like the manifest phenomenal experience of time versus having some social value or practices against around it yeah yeah um yeah i'm reading actually some book i just started reading this book which is on the kind of history of, well, transformation of timekeeping and that. Um, yeah, I love that literature uh, as well. Okay, okay. So then we go from universal manifest time to try to find that anywhere in physics and specifically go through relativity, well, classical physics, but relativity, quantum mechanics, and some of the approaches to quantum gravity. Uh, and, and there's nothing. There's no manifest time never pops up, and and it's in fact hostile to the idea of manifest time. Yeah, um, I mean, I think you know, even even if we just uh, yeah, so uh, even if we just suppose we just stuck with classical physics, you know, so there you've got Newtonian physics, there you have a well-defined simultaneity relation, so it's a it's objective absolute what things are simultaneous with what things even even there you don't find manifest time you know so sometimes people say oh you know uh you know manifest time got you know hurt by you know well for special relativity you know gets rid of an absolute simultaneity general relativity then you've got you know solutions where you don't even you can't even draw a single uh global uh in a global space like entirely space like surface and then you've got all these people saying quantum gravity there's no time at all and so then it looks like a kind of modern thing that there's this conflict between physics and manifest time because the, those three successive alleged hits uh come in in you know 20th century but but really you know even if you're just looking at New newtonian time uh you know, which which time you know that doesn't say which time is the now it doesn't tell you that there's a difference between past present and future um so you know what i thought of it really is you know i, th I just think in terms of the whole problem is really you've got these didactic concepts so dyxis <clears throat> dyxis is uh, the the word for uh uh pointing and so, you know, so, so if I think of it this way, I think of it like, well, physics gives us all these kind of uh, uh, different bits of geometry to represent uh, space and time. So, you know, distances, order, dimensionality, th things like this. And of course that changes, you know, so when we move from classical physics to relativity, it changes and then maybe it'll change more with quantum gravity. Now, to actually use any of those physical models, then you need the the pointing concepts. Yeah, you know, I need to then put in um, 
a now and a here and a, a left and a right and th things like that. But yeah, you know, the curious thing about time though is that we 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 take those pointing concepts seriously with time, but not with space. And by seriously, I mean we take them to be objective. Uh, and so no one thinks that the the the, the spatial ones are, are objective, right? Like if I said, uh, Asher, pass me the salt, you know, it's, it's on your left uh, yeah. at, at dinner. Well, what, what your left already just indicates uh, that uh, I understand that the, it's left and right is due to a didactic center, your perspective. And it's just immediate that it's, uh, uh, not an objective feature of the world. I mean, heck, when you're looking out at the world, you could sort of see your nose a little bit, right? Especially, right? <laughs> and you're, uh, so you, you know that this is kind of, your your concepts of left and right and stuff are perspective, re, you know, pers related to your perspective. But the weird thing about time is that, you know, you don't really like see your nose with, with time. And you, there's, there's nothing, indicating that the time that the now that these uh pointing features are anything but objective um, but yet physics doesn't require them at all so even newtonian physics doesn't require them right and i and i mean like to get to an objective definition of time through well, through newtonian physics relativity quantum mechanics and, and quantum gravity um like i'm totally lost I, I, it just seems like a mixed bag of various definitions of time and the work is still left to do. Uh, yeah, so I think even if, uh, yeah, so I go through, uh, you know, all these times, ways of trying, you know, so it's all, the, all these philosophers and physicists who, who, because they think the problem is really about relativity, are trying to find something like simultaneity and uh, in relativity or a kind of preferred foliation or something like that. And so pretty skeptical of those things too, that they'll work in any way. Um, but uh, but even if they found something, you know, it would be just as, you know, the best they could do is get something like classical physics. Uh, and even then that wouldn't really solve the two times problem. Unless they could further show why that, why, why that, uh, you know, why that, simultaneity that they want to dub the present actually plays the role in my experience of as the present or explains any of my temporal experience right so even if you could find an objective unified measure of time uh you would still need to do the cognitive science and the cognitive psychology of why we have an experience of it in that way yeah yeah, I mean, suppose that, you know, you just, I mean, you could solve the problem easily, you know, if the way is set up by some people, right? Yeah, you know, I could say, Asher, just, you know, tell me some, just grab some set of events and call it the present. And you say, okay, <laughs> you know, it's, and you draw a little circle on, you know, you pick out a volume on in a space time diagram and say, that's the present. And I'll say, oh, well, okay, you've solved the problem, but you haven't solved the problem <laughs> because, you know, what is that present doing? How, how does it affect? Uh, why would a human being sense that thing, and why would it be um, important in any way? Right. Okay. 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 Uh, shifting gears a bit, then going to the cognitive science. Uh, what's the story that we find there? A super interesting one, and uh, yeah, the 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 first that I had when I started looking at uh, the cognitive science uh, of because I was starting off with the present, so I was looking at the kind of construction of the present. Uh, so, well, if we're thinking about the way our experience is, we've got these kind of uh, experiences where things haven't yet fallen into memory, nor are they part of what's anticipated. And so we've got these, these subjective presents. And now, what are these things and how are they constructed? And this is a lot of work on this, and it's, and it's super interesting. And the first thing I thought of was, uh, well, you could actually make a kind of like that argument in relativity against uh, uh, kind of the uh, 
theories like presentism, which say that the only that only the only the present is real, uh, you could do a kind of psychology version of those things because it turns out that you know no two people put together the their subjective presence the same. So if I look at that, look at the way I'm putting together the present, you know, it's it's absolutely remarkable. And instead of going through all the details, uh, in, often in talks, I'll just give the example, uh, an example I use in the in the book, which is of this uh, pilot uh, who was was a he had a kind of yeah I forget where the lesion was, but he had some, a small operation, and he was. Uh, in the in the in the research paper, they I think they talk about he, he was at home with his no he was at his daughter's house and he was recuperating from the operation, and she came home from work and saw that he had taken apart the televisions, and because he thought that the audio and vi audio and visual were out of sync, and then he you know was talking to her, and also noticed that. It was her, and so then they noticed that it was him who was out of sync, not the, the televisions and stuff. And so it's interesting is that if you did a, um, um, you know, one of the kind of standard uh, tests of, of, you know, when, you know, so you can, you can measure subjective simultaneity in different ways by, you know, I could do, give you two signals with a certain lag and ask if they happen at the same time or not. I can ask do a temporal order judgment, which one happened first. So there's all these kind of standard paradigms, that experimental paradigms uh, used in psychology uh, to look at subjective simultaneity. And what's interesting about him is that he uh, he was sound firster. So, our, so sound is slow, light is fast, but our ears are very fast and our eyes are very slow. Uh, you know, if you had a signal at about 12 meters away from you that emitted light and sound then if we took into account all those latencies then you know it should hit your cortex at the same same time when you're about 12 meters away uh but of course you know when we you know when somebody comes up close to you we still their lips the sight the visual image of the lips still matches the sounds and when they go far away from you as long as you can still see their lips, they still match. So our brain is doing a lot of work in terms of um, matching the, the the signals. Anyway, the retired pilot, he had uh, he would hear. So if you came up to him and said hi, I, this could be wrong. But I mean, viewers would have to go check. I could have it the wrong way around, but it's been a while. But I think it, I think he was a sound firster. And so he would hear you say hi and then see your lips move. And he would consciously notice the lag. And so I think there was a 210 millisecond lag between his uh, hear, you know, see, hearing you say hi and then the, the, the lips moving. And well, I always thought that it should be somebody like him because I knew we were putting together things like this. And I always thought, well, if there's something the brain does, there's always a, the chance that the, the brain breaks <laughs> in some way. And so I thought, well, there, there should be somebody like him. And then it the, the, was like an a priori prediction of this man. <laughs> uh, and anyway, uh, this is a good example of we're all doing this. And so when the, when the experimenters then put other people uh, who did not complain about, you know, noticing a lag into the, uh, into the lab. I think about a third of people could no consciously notice the lag between uh, the audio and the visual and these kind of signals. And in fact, some of them were light firsters, some were sound firsters. And so some people, some people didn't notice it actually were like 200 milliseconds the other way. These are huge distances now, so if we added so suppose you were 200 milliseconds sound firster and I was 200 milliseconds light firster. Now that we've got 400 milliseconds, uh, you know, discrepancy between the two. So I'm trying to think of, so that that's like almost, uh, 
So in, in American baseball, that's almost the, the, the time it takes for the ball to go from the pitcher's mound to the, the catcher. So it's definitely in a conscious. Oh yeah, know, it's significant. It's, uh, and yeah, we would not notice in a conversation that, uh, you know, this discrepancy, I think it's just because, you know, the stuff that's interesting isn't labeled and moving that fast in front of us. And when we have things that are fast, we, you know, so if I, if I do this and we are in the same room, well, then the noise is produced when this, the finger hits the fat part of the thumb. So some of us might see, might hear the noise when they're actually still processing the, the vision up there where the fingers up higher. Others where it's been sitting there for a little while. Yeah, everyone's going to agree that the sound came from the snap. You know, the what? You know, no one's going to disagree really, unless I, I put in a huge lag. Um, and so we don't we we don't really notice that much. But we're all living on our own. Yeah. So here's then the pictures of. So for that patient PH, if you ask them, you know what, you know what. Uh, is your now, do you have a now and is your now special? He'd say, yeah, yeah. But then if you ask them to catalog the content of the events that are in his now, it would then differ from yours, right? Because his, he's going to include, you're, you're going to include, you know, his daughter saying hi and her lips moving both in the same now. He's not. But now if we actually had like really precise labels on all the events, We'd find that everybody, everybody's inventory of their special nows are are different, and so they're not that special. I mean, so they're they're all in some sense they're all special, but they're you know, it's like the well, Steve Savage in, in a different context, uh, you know, has this uh, you know Gilbert and Sullivan uh, uh, song in mind where you know if everybody's special, nobody's special. Uh, so uh, anyway, yeah, so cognitive science is then giving this kind of picture where of, you know, basically how you construct these kind of nows. Uh, takes time, a lot of interesting temporal illusions. Um, maybe, it's maybe it's different for different animals. You know, I, I, in the book, I keep joking, you know, that the, you know, maybe the giraffe has not only a long now, but a uh, I mean, uh, not only a long neck, but a long now, uh, because the, you know, the nerves, you know, the, the, the speed along the nerves is, is, is really not that fast. And, you know, the, their head is like nine feet from their hooves. So as they're running and their hooves are trying to navigate the ground, they've got all those signals going back and forth. It's quite, quite a big lag. It, I mean, I don't know how much of that is conscious versus, you know, when we, when we run and when we run, we're not conscious of adjusting our feet either, but, um, or we, well, we can be if we want to be, but we went to not to be, <laughs> uh, anyway, you know, you can then imagine that this kind of, you can then start to see if you think of different animals and stuff, uh, the kind of pressures that would lead to forming, uh, subjective simultaneity of in cer certain sorts of windows for certain types of systems. And so then I think of this as this, this kind of evolved best, best way of, uh, you know, if our, if, if our food, if we had to, if we had to, if, we, if, if to get food or to run away from predators, we had to, uh, you know, maybe in, in some other worlds you could imagine, maybe it made sense to have a, a smaller, tighter simultaneity window in others, you know, a, a larger one. There's pro, pros and cons of each. Uh, right. And it's a complicated evolutionary literature, I'm sure. Yeah. That makes sense. I think, like, you need a theory of self that seems adaptive. And then it seems adaptive to model that theory of self along the lines of manifest time. Because mm -hmm. it would help you escape predators and, and get food. That's right. And then the other aspects, you know, well, if that thing isn't updating, you know, you're you're in big trouble if you're if you're still processing uh, the the tiger roaring at you, and you know, 
an hour later, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, you're not gonna those creatures that had that those that didn't update their simultaneity windows t tended to die off pretty fast, I would imagine. And then, and then, you of course, you have tons of resources from physics for then um, explaining other aspects because you know, you're throwing this embedded subject into the world, but that world has already got like a, you know a thermodynamic asymmetry, and it's got all these other features to it. Uh, you know, the time-like direction is one-dimensional. The space-like direction is a three-dimensional. And so all these, so I think of all this kind of physics is already, well, A, one, one thing that's important is I, I think it's then a mistake to say that like that relativity spatializes time or, or something like that. Because there's so many differences still. And then you, what you try to do is marshal the, how those differences would make it, them would, um, show themselves in a in a person who is going around navigating life with this kind of who's updating these kind of special presence and then you know what they're going to find is that they that when they make decisions in those presents you know they can affect um they can affect uh things in the future but not the past and that's not due to them that's due to living in a and they're in that universe, yeah.